Welcome to the final day of the HS Arena Invitational. We have eight players left from our field of 32 who will play off for a $5,000 first pri prize pool. $3,000 first prize. I'm your host, Callum Leslie. Joining me once again, Sotil and Firebat, uh, who have been expert analysts throughout the past two days and are here to bring you some wonderful analysis once again. Firebat, it's been a long road to get to this point, but we have an absolutely stacked top eight. Yeah, really, really incredible group of players left. A lot of players showing their consistency, knocking out some of the open qualified players, but one open qualified player does happen to make it through. Really excited to see uh, how he does in the tournament. Yep, and that is two beers. He goes up and against Strife Crow in our fourth quarter final of the day. Uh, but Sorrel, who are you looking at as, as the favorites to take the whole thing out of this field of eight? Um, there's, a, there's a couple of uh, interesting names that pop out of me. Um, I think, like, generally you'd look at 6-0 to be a favorite to, to win just about anything he plays in at this point. He's just um, a consistent play. He's had consistent tournament results recently after uh, going through, uh, debatably, maybe a little bit of a blip at one point uh, during the end of his tenure on Archon. Um, coming back really strong now, amazing ladder finishes, uh, amazing tournament performances as well. Mr. Yagoot, probably a bit of a sleeper, someone that we all know is an incredible player, but doesn't quite get the, the, the maybe the invites to tournaments that some of the other most successful people do, so I'd be looking at him as well. Um, and then I guess Strive Crow is just one of the best Hearthstone players in the world, you have to throw his name in there as well. It's been a little while since Strive Crow's really won anything major firebat, but he can never be counted out. Yeah, definitely. He's one of those players that uh, whenever he feels like to focus in on the game, he can definitely steal a championship whenever he wants to. And he's shown that in the past by having like periods where he hasn't been playing Hearthstone too often and then he doesn't do quite as good, but then he gets back into it really hard and then starts winning everything again. So maybe it's one of those times where he's going to start spiking back onto the scene really hard. So the story of this tournament so far has really been the strength of Paladin. We've seen a number of different versions from more very aggressive secret Paladins to the uh, double zombie chow version that a couple of players are playing, like Zelay, to uh, even just mid-range Paladin on its own without secrets has been just the class to be. Right. Um, we were having a little talk before off air. The topic came up of like who got the best cards in the in the new expansion, and you know, the we the winner was probably Paladin. And then if you look back to GVG and like who got the best deal out of that, that was probably Paladin as well. So it's no great surprise that Paladin is just a really big power class right now. Um, we saw a couple of 3-0 sweeps early on when people decided not to respect the Paladin and was leaving it open. And then as the tournament progressed, there was more of a trend developing towards players uh, actually saying, all right. Maybe we have to respect this deck and just ban it out. So it'll be interesting to see how the top eight plays out in terms of uh, bans. It's interesting that we, we talk about the strength of Paladin, but actually in the top half of our, of our finals bracket, we only have one Paladin among the four players. Uh, all four players in the bottom half have brought it, but actually it's only uh, Zelay who has Paladin is lighting up from the uh, the top half of the bracket. It's going to be Yagoot versus Zelay in our first quarterfinals coming up in just a couple of minutes, and then RDU versus Sixo, Eloise versus Nyria, and then Strife Crow versus Two Beers that we mentioned. Uh, we saw Zelay get a 3-0 sweep with the Fatigue Warrior at the end of the day yesterday. Um, the Paladin deck that he's bringing also is, is very interesting. It's the, the four secret double zombie chow version of that deck. And uh, he appears like he might have made a couple of interesting meta calls far about that. We talked about Zelay maybe being a player who plays very standard decks, but actually he's maybe going a little bit outside of that here. Uh, with the zombie challenge, the zombie challenge just is uh, a standard list for sure. It's just like a different archetype of the Secret Paladin. It's uh, a list that Cross took the number one legend quite recently. It's been all over the place. And uh, I don't know, maybe what tech are you referring to specifically? Well, I just mean in terms of what the other players are bringing. Most players uh, are bringing kind of the more standard secret paladin or just a more mid-range variant, but he's bringing yeah. the, the lesser secrets. I, I guess mean, he's seen... taken the, the control warrior all the way through to fatigue warrior as well, whereas most people are just bringing like a more yeah, standard yeah. control deck as well. So It's definitely a little more control-oriented, a little bit maybe trying to target some of the faster decks, be just a one step slower, and maybe that'll be able to seal up the victory for him. Maybe that's the mindset. Yeah, I mean, even a scrub like me was able to go 8-0 and with that Paladin deck earlier <laughs> today. So, uh, you know, it's pretty strong at rank 13, guys, I can tell you that. But it does seem like potentially a, a winning archetype just because it's so good against the other Paladins and just has the consistent strength of Paladin right now. Mm -hmm. it turns out it's pretty good when you play the best possible drop on every turn in your curve with Zombie Joe, Minibot, Muster. 
what yeah, but well, this is wrong. the thing. You, t- you take the existing Paladin deck, which is just great drops on two f- onwards, and you add in the best one drop. Yeah, it seems go. like that would be a, a pretty good way to go. But uh, yeah, so we're getting into our first game here, Zalei versus Yagut. And uh, we can see the classes and the bands there for you. So Yagut has his Druid, his Rogue, and Hunter. His Shaman has been banned. Uh, don't blame Zalei there. A bit of a tough matchup for him. And uh, Yagut choosing to ban out the Fatigue Warrior and leaving up the... Druid, Paladin, and Hunter of Zalei. So yeah. What do we think of the ban on the Fatigue Warrior? Yeah, it's an interesting exchange. Uh, you'd think Shaman is, is one of those classes, much like Paladin, that can kind of do okay against that kind of fatigue strategy, because you can always develop some sort of board presence. Um, but maybe Yagut just won the Battle of the Mind Games, was expecting his Shaman to go, because his Shaman, he looks at his lineup and thinks his Shaman has a good chance against several of Zalei's decks. So he makes the read that Zalei will identify that, ban his Shaman, and then that would leave him in a position with, uh, with a tough time against the Warrior, so he thinks he has to play it safe and get rid of the Warrior preemptively to avoid that situation. Yeah, and it definitely seems to make a lot of sense, and I totally agree with what you said there. So Yagut, I think, actually came out ahead in this ban phase by predicting that uh, Zalei would be banning the Shaman. Only Rogue and the only Shaman player in this tournament, Yogo. He certainly brought... We can definitely say he's brought on an Orthodox lineup because he's brought the yeah. only instance of those two classes among 32 players. He was the only one to bring either. But the Rogue is left up and... I mean, Yogo is known as a strong Rogue player. Always has been all, all the way back to the days of Miracle Rogue. Firebat, you're also a player who favours the Rogue very heavily uh, in the past. Is there a place for Rogue, particularly in a Paladin-heavy meta? Yeah, Rogue can do a lot of work against Paladin. We've seen Yagut has some defensive techs in there to maybe outlast the Secret Paladin's sort of firepower. He's got like the Sludge Belchers in there and he's added in Doctor Boom to maybe try and win the value game because Rogue can sometimes fall short against Secret Paladin because they actually have so many high value cards with their aggression with the the Doctor 6, Doctor 7, Doctor 8 line. It can sometimes be hard to compete with. So those sort of techs might be something that'll allow him to seize victory. So, what do you think of the of the place of Rogue in the current meta? It's interesting. Um, it's it's an awkward deck. It's it's similar to Priest in a lot of ways, where you can build it to do one specific job really, really well, but then as soon as you queue into the wrong matchup, the tech choices that you've made kind of leave you exposed against the rest of the field, um, which makes it not a great ladder deck because, of course, ladder you're building against the field. But if you bring it in a in a last hero standing lineup. Uh, where you have a, a solid strategy in mind in what you're aiming at particularly, and you, you're able to manipulate the, the pick ban phase to get it um, against the target that you want to, and you're confident in being able to do that, then it makes a lot of sense as a pick for someone that's as confident playing Rogue as, as Mr. Yagoot is. Well, I'm going to put you guys on the spot now, because we're into the finals. It's uh, starting to get serious. Fab, I know you have an interest here in uh, your teammates' delay, but who do you think is going to take this matchup? To take this matchup, looking at the lineups, they both have Druid, which sort of kind of cancels out a little bit. The Rogue is probably giving Yagut a little bit of an edge here, honestly, with Zalei having Druid and Paladin up. And then the Hunters sort of cancel each other out. So I would actually favor Yagut here, just based on lineups. Soto, what do you think? Yeah, I go along with that. I, I think Yagut has a decent chance here. Like we said, he's won the Battle of the Mind Games a little bit in the ban phase, so I'm going to go for Yagut here. This would be such a huge result for Yagut if he was able to go deep into this tournament. He hasn't uh, really shown in, in any major tournaments, gotten all the way to like the final stages. If he was able to even win this tournament, it would be huge for him. Of course, a, a teamless player showing that players who don't have teams can can get it done. Uh, lots of Germans in this tournament as well. So he'd be looking to maybe hit to 6-0 next, uh, in the next round. Maybe even two beers in the final. Wouldn't that be great? Must take Yagut versus two beers <laughs> in our, an all-German final. But that's, uh, that's a bit down the way. That's going to come later on today. Uh, and he's going to get past Soleil, who's a very formidable player. But it's going to be Paladin versus Druid in our first matchup. Yeah, it looks like zalei has got the better end of this matchup. Paladin, definitely a strong favorite against Druid. But looking at the opening hands here, yagut has got a pretty juicy start. Yeah, if you were going to pick some cards out of your deck to uh, try and counteract what uh, an aggressive board focus deck like Paladin wants to do, those would be uh, pretty high on the list. Just just slap and innovate in there and we're good to go, right? Oh, Yugu yeah. actually chooses to send back the Keeper. That's interesting to me. Well, he picks up the swipe, so that's not a bad exchange there. Yep. Definitely going to be very helpful against things like Muster for Battle, which can snowball the Paladin board state into an insurmountable feat. Alright, I do feel like Keeper can definitely have a lot of value in this matchup, but you know, it's not, it's not a 
ridiculously rare occurrence for something like, you know, an Avenge hitting a Haunted Creeper early on and you just get insane value out of a Keeper of the Grove Silence effect early on. So uh, interesting that he was valuing looking for other cards there, but like you said, Swipe is a key card to pick up as well just because of the amount of tokens they can generate on the board in the early game. Let me think. Yeah, it doesn't look like Zalei has too many ways to deal with an Aspirin if he doesn't coin out the Knife Juggler here. So he's going to hesitate a little bit, I guess, think about that and try and value. How much does he value the coin over the possibility of Aspirin? And he doesn't. Or you mean does. <laughs> right. I mean, if we were to see the coin knife juggler, there it is, as you say, specifically to deal with Aspirant, because it's it, I, like it's one of those plays that on the surface looks terrible, because, you know, you're taught when you're learning Hearthstone, like, why would you coin a two-drop with no follow-up? That doesn't make any sense. Um, but sometimes, like, there's no absolutes in Hearthstone. Sometimes you have to do something that you're taught is wrong because the situation uh, deems that it's right. Yeah, and with this Aspirant being able to stick now, Yakut's looking like he's starting this game off in a commanding position. Right, because if, yeah, if the Knife Juggler comes down here, he's just going to get absolutely crushed by this Keeper of the Groves. Yeah, well... Oh, that is never a good feeling as the Paladin player. This is a matchup you're supposed to be starting out with the early game board presence in, and now you're just getting pummeled by this Druid. Yeah. Um, so natural turn three play. Uh, we talked about you know best possible two drop, best possible three drop, etc. All the way out the curve. That's what Paladin uh, is trying to do. But uh, sometimes classes just line up perfect answers to all those things, and the, the draws just line up against you. And Muster for Battle is really not going to do a great deal here. It's actually just a little bit slow based compared to the board that he's facing. And we do yeah. see the swipe in the opponent's hand. So. It's a sad day when your muster for battle is too slow. Yeah, right. Three mana to generate three one ones to equip a light's justice just isn't cutting it. Yep. That's not a happy time. But does he have to still just do it? I don't see any other like really solid plays here. Um, I think there's like potential to coin the shredder, try and back it up with cold hammer next turn, that sort of thing. Try and generate some presence on the board over two turns that way. But I definitely don't hate the play just to get the one ones. Onto the board, um, cross your fingers. Obviously, he has no idea that the swipe is coming, and honestly, swipe might not Swipes. even be the best play yeah. here. Um, you can just jam Shredder and keep going at this point. You're so far ahead that like you have enough bodies on board to trade with the one ones, which is usually the problem, right? As Druid, you play one minion at a time, and you don't have enough bodies to really deal with all the one ones efficiently. But Mister Yagut has the two minions in play that can just efficiently trade down to the one ones and develop whatever he feels comfortable developing. Yeah, and I guess the only possible merit to the swipe here is that it um, protects the Dynasis Aspirant, protects his mana investment for the long term, but at this point he's kind of uh, got his value out of it, but he is going to value using the swipe and protecting his Aspirant. That's interesting. I would have thought that uh, Druid of the Claw would come down. This plays around Blessing of Kings, potentially. So, a little more board control centric. I guess he just assumes he's far enough ahead. Why take any risks, right? Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, keeps the Shredder alive, keeps his mana investment going, might be uh, relevant in the in the coming turns if he picks up a 7-drop, but he does of course have that Innovate that he can use to just get that one big power spike turn if Let he wanted it, so see. the additional one mana isn't too important. Like we said, it's kind of did it, like this Aspirant has done its job as soon as that Keeper came down a turn early to shoot down that Knife Juggler, like that was enough, you can be happy with that and just say, alright buddy, you've done your job, like time to retire you at this point. Yeah, and... How does Zelay kind of surmount this board back? Mm. Like, he has Dr. Boom, so if he can survive around till turn set, turn like six maybe even, and use the coin Dr. Boom, if there's no big game hunter to deal with it, that's a card that can really fight back the board for him. But at the same time, his life total is getting so low by the aggressive use of swipe by Mr. Yagu. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's the other um, byproduct of the swipe usage that turn. It puts the Paladin on a really yeah. short clock, and then he has the Druid of the Claw he can potentially use aggressively for ch in charge form later on, instead of, you know, that would have been his play on the previous turn, playing it in Dawn form. So um, that might be another thing he was looking at, where he can just, you know, set up a really fast kill before we get into the, the area of the game where this deck actually excels, which is surprising when you consider, like, how aggressive as a, of a deck people think it is. But yeah. really, it's like the late game turns where it's actually incredibly powerful. Yeah, definitely. The turn six, the turn seven, and the turn eight are the scary ones, and uh, hmm. this Paladin might not be able to make it to those turns by the aggression Mr. Yagut's been able to put on, thanks to the Wild Growth and, uh, well, not the Wild Growth, but the Aspirant Wild Growth effect sure. and the other ramping and aggression of Keeper. Wow. Oh, okay, Frostwolf Grunt's annoying, because I was going to say there's a decent chance whatever minion comes out of this just gets ignored, but unfortunately, Taunt is cheat. You're not allowed to ignore it. <sighs> yeah. So he's just going to pick up the value trade, push another two. That leaves him threatening eight more next turn. So a little bit short of lethal with the Druid Claw in his hand. Ooh, Sludge Belcher's drawn to the hand. A good defensive option for Zelay. But will it be enough? I don't know. <laughs> mm. 
Yeah, so as Zelay here, he's got a few options. He's going to use this coin still if he wants to use it prior to being able to get Dr. Boom if he feels like maybe there's just too much pressure being mounted by the, the Druid player and he can't really afford to save the coin for Dr. Boom. He could have maybe some sort of like Aldor plus coin up the cog hammer to try and get a little bit more board control than even Sludge Belcher could offer, but sure. I think I think you have to hold out for the coin. Like you have to try and wait to get that coin Dr. Boom and hope that swing turns enough. Hope your opponent doesn't have enough burn to kill you. Well, that's interesting here. Just like with the draw that um, Zelay has had, you'd be forgiven for thinking he's just playing mid-range Paladin. We haven't seen him draw any secrets, but you know we we know from seeing the deck on over the last couple of days that this is it is the low secret version. It's the more mid-rangey version, the version we talked about at the start with the extra zombie chows. Um, but there is mysterious challenger, and there are secrets mm. in this deck. But he's really just been drawing into the mid-range Paladin cards, and they just haven't been uh, haven't been explosive enough to to come back against this insanely fast start from Yugu. I mean, that's what happens when the Aspirant is able to stabilize. That's why we were talking earlier on turn two, that, or turn one, maybe Zelay should uh, coin out the Knife Juggler, but like, it's a risk because if you coin it out and then they don't have Aspirant, you feel a little silly when they Wild Growth and you have no follow-up. Yeah. But it's something that could try and prevent this sort of situation of the Aspirant. It's fine. Your, your follow-up is three to the dome, hero power one more to the dome. That's perfectly <laughs> solid, right? Sometimes it's not enough, especially with that Dark <laughs> Doom in your hand. Yeah. And Mr. Yugu showing his aggression here, trying to set up lethal with this force of nature for the following turn. And how is Zelay going to be able to even come back from this? Like, he has some options to try and do some board clear here, but that's just surrendering his tempo back over to the Druid, who could then possibly reload with even more big minions. Yeah, and because of the aggression from Yugu, like you said, um, Zelay seems to have valued that coin heavily because of how he can use it to what accelerate his Dr. Think? Boom, but... There's the, he just dies here if he plays Doctor yeah. Boom. So that whole strategy of you know holding on to accelerate that really high value card in his hand has just not worked out, and he's forced to uh, make a defensive play this turn. And it's, there's a good chance the coin just just goes unused. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not looking good for him. The Druid has just so many of these offensive options, and he was able to recognize all right. Zelay's taking weak turns. Maybe he's trying to hold out for something. Well, if he's going to start stumbling and be weak, I'm going to just take it right to the face and make him have to play stronger turns. All right, so he is going to use the coin to spend seven mana this turn, but not quite how he would have wanted to. Uh, makes the most defensive play possible. Consecrate uh, coin Aldor, neutralizes the board, but um, that is... Ooh. Ooh. All right. That is just barely enough. Since the Aspirant has died, he's... Uh, found himself back down to seven mana so force of nature plus hero power not quite a possibility um, but this does look like just a matter of time at this point with uh, the low health of the paladin of course there's no healing in this deck it's one of the things that you do sacrifice to make room for the, the secrets package so he's in a bit of trouble yeah he has the ability to either like wild growth this turn to try and combo next turn or he can use the savage roar here to use his face to be able to trade up with the uh the Aldor and set of lethal with the, the Shredder. But it looks like he's going to opt to try and keep the combo pieces together and have the full combo next turn to deal with any sort of smaller taunts that Zelay could produce because he knows the big main taunt is can't come out in time, which would be Tyrion Forgery. Yeah, he knows he doesn't have to beat Tyrion, so he's considering beating perhaps a second Sludge Belcher, beating Coghammer, and I guess Noble Sacrifice is the third, quote, taunt that you have to worry about. Um, yep. So as long as he has a plan in his head to beat those three cards, he can pretty much do whatever he wants at this point and be pretty confident this game is getting locked up. Yes, yeah, so Zelay has the option of the cog hammer, but he's going even lower, and I don't think that cog hammer taunt is going to be enough. And a stealth minion <laughs> gets spawned as well that he can't remove now, so that's going to be guaranteed damage with the Savage Roar. Yeah, and even if, you know, some some sort of huge taunt like a Sludge Belcher comes down now, that just helps him to push through even more efficiently because he won't have to dunk the entire five damage into dealing with it. Yeah. So we were talking about earlier how this is one of the uh, slower Paladin lists, and we were saying it does very good against the other Paladins because it's a little bit slower, but uh, I guess it's too slow to be able to deal with Druid as efficiently as the uh, the traditional Secrets Paladin. Yeah, that's interesting. He did have the Knife Juggler to try and take a shot at the Patient Assassin there, but even if it had gone down, he still pushes through, right? Face and one tree to clear the taunt, and then two trees to face would have been plenty of damage, so um, a little irrelevant flourish from the Knife Juggler there, just being the uh, disobedient fellow we all know he is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and game one, going to Mr. Yagu. 
All right, well, Paladin, we talked about it being super strong, and of course, it would be the first deck to lose in the tournament, but uh, <laughs> just a really strong start from Igu on the Druid there. Yeah, definitely, really strong. Aspirant, one of those cards that if it's a big risk to play it out on two because sometimes things can go wrong and it can die, and then you're kind of stuck in a hole, but when it sticks, it is insanely powerful. You get the effect of the Wild Growth and the 2 3 body. Well, looking at Zelay's remaining decks, he has the Hunter and also his own Druid available, Salto. Which which of those do you think would uh, be the best option? Does he go with the Hunters at a good matchup, or does he take the coin flip? Uh, depends on the build. I think his build was more mid-rangey, and looking now at the Mulligan screen, yeah, we see Houndmasters and things. Uh, definitely um, mid-range Hunter wow. with things like Houndmaster and things like High Main is pretty effective against a Druid, um, but not when you draw 5 and 6 in your opening hand. Yeah, the... the the late game curve, obviously, you kind of want that in the late game. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Who would have thought? But uh, Hunter's Mark he had in his hand, I saw that off the mulligan. That's a pretty pretty good card against Druid for just trying to pick up some early game tempo initiative. Yeah, and we saw he did not mulligan into a 2-drop off the top. You just about saw the hero power flying out on turn 2. Turn 2 hero power, not something Hunter ever wants to be doing. Uh, but he's picked up a nice option for turn 3, at least, and his curve will start going. He's really happy that he did not get Huffer there because Huffer would open Yagut's ability to just uh, coin Keeper of the Grove and deal with it for just a huge tempo game. Right, and the risk of the Leoc here is the coin piloted Shredder just to contest it really nicely, but he has the Eagle Horn Bow and nothing else to do this turn anyway, so uh, Leoc looks like a much better outcome here overall than... Uh... Usually, usually Huffer's the one you like. Um, on, honestly, a mid-range hunter, generally Misha is, is good more often than yeah. not. But Leoc, usually the, the unappreciated brother of the animal companion family. But in this situation, not too bad. So both players missed their early game. Neither of them did anything on turn two. And I think that hurts the druid more than it actually hurts the mid-range hunter. Yeah, I would agree with that. If they can't get a, a big enough advantage on the board before something like high main comes down, they, you know, they're forced to deal with it. They're not in a good enough position to just ignore it and race for damage. Um, Druid, one of the classes that really does struggle to deal with it. Um, even with both Keepers of the Grove in, in Yagut's draw, um, you know, silencing the 6-5 often isn't enough because you then don't have enough mana left over to deal with it efficiently unless you've loaded up a big board behind it. Um, so... Yeah, and it turns out 6-5s are pretty big. <laughs> yeah. We could even see, like, Hunter's Mark come out this turn to power through this bear while developing a 6-5, and that's just an insane tempo swing when you're able to develop a 6-mana minion and remove a 5-mana minion from your opponent's side of the board. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this this Savannah High Main is going to double up as a fire elemental and deal 3 damage to that Druid of the Claw this turn as well by using the Hunter's Mark. So. Yeah, that is... It's a pretty good fire elemental yeah. on that card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so looking from the Druid side, now how do you feel when you stare down the high main and your bear just disappears that was your only form of protection? Uh, feels bad, man. I mean, you have <laughs> you have the Keeper. Like I said, you, oh, feel, like, you feel like I, ha I have an answer. I can silence these 2-2 two, two hyenas that just aren't relevant at the moment, but that 6-5 is still going to like pound the crap out of me, so... Yeah, you're in a pretty rough spot. Um, honestly, nothing looks too attractive. You can try and get Druid of the Claw to stick to stall, but it's just giving a free trade to your opponent that isn't nice. Um, I guess you can play you can play Druid of the Claw and just hope the high main has to go into it, and in that case you then have Keeper of the Grove Wrath on the following turn to sure. deal with it cleanly. That's probably your best hope at this point. Um, but he might just go for maximum board development, go wide as possible, play the two minions with the Aspirant or the Shredder, or even just play Shredder and Wrath down the Belcher to get the efficient trade on that. Yeah, I kind of like the two minions just trying to outdevelop your opponent, but uh, all of the lines don't look very appealing. Uh, it looks like he's going to try and start dealing with this Belcher and then develop. I like that as well. Just whatever uses your most, most mana most efficiently, because you can't be uh, too optimistic in the fact that that uh, Druid of the Claw is really going to start working on that high main at all. Yeah, agreed. Um, so, high main is free for one turn on the board, which is an incredibly advantageous situation for a hunter. Anytime you get to use your high main on your terms as a hunter, you're feeling pretty good about your life. And he has plenty of gas to follow it up. He has an extra sludge belcher that can fit in nicely with a quick shot if he wants to go down that route. Or he could just go full board development and play two minions of his own this turn and just really activate the race on the druid player. Yeah, Sludge Belcher was in mid-range hunter for a little while, and its purpose really was just to kind of protect your high main. Just make sure that high main can never get popped and can always just be clocking your opponent. 
and it looks like it might be serving that purpose pretty good here. As we saw, Mr. Yagut had to spend his turn dealing with the, the Sludge Belcher first before he could even start getting to work on the terrifying high main. All right. So high main goes face. Yeah, and he's just going to go for the maximum development strategy here. Sludge Belcher and Haunted Creeper. Max out the board. Gives him a lot of options if he draws something like a Houndmaster next turn and just presents another problem. Just not allowing his opponent to get to this high main. And it really um, plays around something like the second Keeper of the Grove. Because as we mentioned, just silencing this high main doesn't actually do anything in terms of tempo, in terms of alleviating pressure. You have to have the answer to go along with it. And if there's the Sludge Belt, you're protecting it. Your, your range of potential answers is just so much lower. Yeah. So do you remember back in uh, Old Hearthstone, the high main rule? Where if high main ever hit you in the face, you were just doomed to lose the game. Does that still apply now that more sets have come out? I believe it does, right? Twitch chat can <laughs> confirm, but I don't believe Amaz has ever lied. So I yeah. think if Amaz said that, that is entirely true. All right. That makes some sense. I think here, as the Druid player, you really just got to YOLO. I don't think you can play too defensively here. I think all your defense's options are, like, too weak. So I think you just got to drop this Dr. Boom and then uh, cross your fingers and hope some magic can happen. So how much are you taking if you play Boom? You're taking 10 from the board, 2 from Hero Power, so 12. You're asking him for 8. Yeah, that seems reasonable. It's probably the play to win here, for sure. Let's just get it in, see what happens. I mean, these Boom bots could do some magic here and just really, like, take down the high main almost by themselves. I don't know. <laughs> some hope. Wow, Zalei has just uh, so many ways that he can deal damage. But in Zalei's shoes, how afraid of you are things like Savage Roar or possibly even like an Innervate combo stealing this game away from you? Yeah, that's the, always the danger against Druid. It's such a scary class to try and race, even when you are playing what um, you know popular wisdom would say is a more aggressive class in Hunter. Um, generally, if you get into that situation where you just both start ignoring every minions, they have the way to snowball their minions with the Savage Roar, whereas you don't. You know, your damage comes from hand and from your hero power. Um, so they, they're the value of their minions on the board in a race is kind of more valuable than yours. So you do have to kind of keep that in mind a little bit. Um, but it seems like Zalei is not too interested in making too many trades here. He might just yeah. choose to take down the boom bots. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it leaves himself sense. two dogs available and then attacks with the horny creeper. So there's no way that boom bot explosion could screw him here. Um, good ordering there from Zalei. Yeah, yeah. Getting his opponent down extremely low. Does not look like too great of a situation for Yagu to come in. Wow. The only target on the board that increases power. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Never lucky. Uh, I mean, Yagu could potentially have cleared this board if he had found something like a swipe, maybe. I mean, that's a pretty good draw this turn. It opens up the Innovate Concede play, which is looking pretty strong right now. Good old Innovate Concede. Well, is there any way he can kind of like uh, scavenge for another turn to try and find more information about Soleil's Hunter deck? Uh, well, he can heal to 11 and hero power, go back down to 8, trade up. No, I don't think so. I think he's just dead. Uh, Druid of the Claw, innovate. You could leave yeah. it with 5 more mana, so you could use the Keeper to silence something. Yeah, pretty sure he's just dead. And uh, he yeah. comes with the um, comes to the same conclusion. And he's going to top the series. Uh, Zalei is going to top the series. One game to one. Yep. No aggression there, unfortunately, for Miku to be able to uh, race the Hunter. And he did get out raced by the more aggressive class. Even with the more mid-range version with the sludge belchers and things, we do see uh, we see that being kind of a theme throughout Zalei's lineup, right? He's taking even Control Warrior and making it more control -y. He's making the Sacred Paladin more control-heavy. He's adding things. He's playing belchers in his, in his mid-range yeah. Hunter. He's really looking to just uh, control the board and kind of run the table a bit. Yeah, definitely. Cards like Hunter's Mark, especially, aren't very good against aggro, as the aggro minions usually have one health anyway. So you send them to one health, you're not really getting too far. But against control, the minions often have upwards of like even eight health sometimes. So being able to just use Hunter's Mark zero mana deal three damage, as we saw there, is extremely powerful for these tempo sort of matchups. All right, well, you're going to try with this Rogue to try and take the ser the lead back. Series is balanced at one to one going into game three. Yeah, this is an old school, like, traditional matchup back when, like, Miracle Rogue was a thing. Miracle Rogue was the number one counter to old Hybrid Hunter with, like, Buzzard Unleash and stuff. So right. it's, like, a matchup that goes way back. And uh, we're going to see, maybe it's still the same. 
Yeah, it's interesting. There are a lot of interactions in this matchup that work out in Rogue's favor. You know, the, the classical one that everyone talks about is Sap for Savannah High Main, just pretty much the most efficient way of dealing with it in the game. But there are other interactions outside of that that work out pretty nicely for the Hunter. So it's it's not a it's not a one sided match. It's a it's a very curved, very snowball dependent matchup. And it's one of those matchups where Rogue is really looking for like a strong prep turn to really steal tempo somewhere around uh, turn four, turn five. Um, and also looking for like the right early game answers to line up against Hunter's aggression. Yeah, this knife juggler is so terrifying. I think actually in your good shoes here, I would just eviscerate it and deal with it now because if you let that guy stick, it's just gonna accumulate so much damage as the game continues. Yeah, I was just gonna ask you about that. I think, um, you know, the eviscerate is potentially really swingy with the um, Violet Teacher on turn four with the prep, but I don't think you can wait that long while a knife juggler is beating you down, so. Phantom Dives drawn to the hand, not too much action with it, but at least it's a spell that he can use with Violet Teacher in the prep next turn. Yep, and uh, Weapon Deadly Poison, pretty solid for him to bridge the gap until that turn. Um, so he'd be looking for a, a, a weakish turn. Yeah, a nice Haunted Creeper would be lovely here from Yagoot's perspective. Well, Zelay does not have too many good options. We do see that the uh, Freezing Trap is green, so he has a different trap than Freezing Trap up right now. But uh, other than that, his only other play would possibly be Hero Power. Yeah. Um, since it is a different different trap, number one suspect in this situation is probably Snake Trap, in which case the, the Violet Teacher prep turn with the Phantom Knives is actually looking pretty impressive uh, in the next couple of turns. Yeah, definitely would be pretty strong. It's going to be interesting to see if maybe he tries to like cycle the fan this turn with the prep just so that he can uh, have 1-1 one -one tokens to break the Freezing Trap. No, he's going to wait on it. He probably suspects the Snake and wants to make sure he has that tool for that. Sure. So, I mean, Pilot Shredder, you're developing it into a Deadly Poison Dagger, which doesn't feel great, but when your alternative option is uh, playing Hell Master or pretty much playing nothing, looks like you just kind of have to slam it. The Agood has some powerful options this turn with being able to get spell powered fan and generate tons of 1 1 tokens off the Violet Teacher and deal with all the snakes. It's showing that uh, Rogue's still pretty good against mid range Hunter. A massively swingy turn. All right. I mean, he he lucks out a little bit that he gets more than one health on his on his shredder token, but it's not going to make a hell of a lot of difference. Yeah, definitely. I think we're going to see the Azadrake come down, and I think we're going to see a prep fan. I guess he's just kind of running through all of his other options because he can hold on to the prep if he wants to save it for a more swingy turn. Yeah, he has. He can play basically any combination of cards. He can use the prep and then generate the SI afterwards, um, which is probably the weakest option. But yeah, this was the option Blood Mage um, fan. Then he could also just get the bigger minion out with the Azure Drake and use the prep for the fan. So uh, he's going to value holding on to the preparation, has the Azure Drake in his hand. So. Um, he's gonna be able to draw into uh, a couple more options, and then maybe next turn the prep can use him to. He can be used to accelerate something else out. Just absolutely crush the board in terms of tempo. I wonder. Yeah, this is uh, not looking too good for Zelay here. I mean, he has Lothab, which is one of the key cards in this matchup. But uh, is this a board you really want to be throwing Lothab down on? Mm, so if you do Lothab here, what are you what are you expecting your opponent to be able to do to deal with it? Uh, you're expecting them to... Well, your, your hopes and dreams are they have all spells in their hand, mm -hmm. and they sit there and cry. But, <laughs> as we can see here, Yagoot has the Ezer Drake that he can develop in the face of Lothab, so maybe that's why he decided to hold it back in the previous turn. That's a good point. But the, the tokens have been generated here, so the Freezing Trap is going to get very little value. Yagoot will be extremely confident with what this remaining trap is, having seen the Snake Trap activate last turn. Um, so yeah, it looks just like develop Drake and uh, just go in nice and hard. He could also, there's a really, really inefficient trade if he wants to value the ball clear, but I don't see any world in which that happens. Yeah, the Drake does get developed and we're just going to go in and start piling on the damage. Yeah, this matchup usually does fizzle down to a point where it becomes a race and we're starting to see that happen here. Now, Zelay has a few defensive options with something like Unleash the Hounds and... Uh, kill command, but not really the place you want to be in as a hunter. Normally, you want to be using Unleash the Hounds to go face and kill command to go face. Yeah, his hand is kind of stacked up with damage now. He has th three kind of burn options between the Unleash, the kill command, and the quick shot, but they are probably going to have to be used to um, 
to gain some sort of control over the board, because when you're looking back at a rogue opponent who has this many cards in their hand, you're suspecting some form of burn in their hand as well, so you probably consider yourself mm -hmm. quite far behind in this race. Yeah, I'm, ex I'm probably expecting to see an Unleash the Hounds here, and then maybe a Kill Command on the Ezra Drake and a trade into the Violet Teacher, and just sort of finish off the Thalnos and poke a doggy face. Quickly. Looks good to me. It's just so defensive, though. It's like not the not in the Hunter line of thinking. It just feels so weird. <laughs> yeah. The only like proactive play you can make, like the only board development play, would be something like you know, owling the Thalnos and then how mastering the owl for board presence. But you're so exposed to things like Blade Flurry from your opponent. Then, like if your opponent has Blade Flurry in that situation, you probably just lose the game. He leaves up the Ezra Drake. That's going to give a Rogue spell power. Definitely something that you got to be kind of scared of because Rogue can do a lot of nasty things with spell power. Sure. And with the preparation in his hand, he pretty much has the options to do any one of those nasty things that he <laughs> sees fit this turn. So, Yeah. He's just got a fistful of so options to kill options. Zelay here. It's not looking very good. But as uh, Zelay felt he had to turn on the aggression. It's a race, and he's got to win him sometimes. So he's taking some risks here, and it's going to probably come back to cost him as the spell power allows so many good ways to just deal with the Lotha with the spell power eviscerate with even some like spell power blade flurry with the oil can just toast so much damage yeah leaving spell power around when you have a, a five health minion on the board feels particularly dangerous because of those two things you mentioned like pink oil gives you a four attack dagger and eviscerate is obviously a four damage removal spell so those numbers line up quite nicely if you leave them with spell power yeah and the uh the oil here is going to come down with the Blade Flurry, making the Drake just a terrifyingly big minion. And uh, doing a lot of damage to Zelay. Just going all the way in this turn of this face as well. I like it. You get it done while you have the spell power. Get that one extra damage in. Sure. Plenty of mana left over to re-dagger next turn and play the SI Agent. He has the cheap um, Apprentice in his hand to activate combo if need be. So plenty of mana to do what he needs to do next turn. Yeah, and Soleil's got to be a little nervous here. He's got to be expecting his opponent to have the damage to finish him off, especially when he gets eviscerated right in the face. <laughs> yeah, so the second Freezing Trap is something you can feel reasonably confident in here, I think, because you've seen, uh, if he's been paying attention to Yagoot's games, obviously he hasn't seen his full deck yet, um, but he's seen that it's kind of a slower um, build of Oil Rogue, so you'd expect that something like uh, the, the South Sea Deckhand isn't in the list. Um, so you would imagine the Freezing Trap does lock out this Azir Drake here. Mm -hmm. Well, Yakut is one damage off lethal here as he does not have enough mana to dagger and combo both of the SI7 agents. Yeah. So. Just going to use one SI to combo the other tough. by the looks of things. Yeah, uh, both dagger face here. Yep. And yeah. this is a pretty good setup against a freezing trap because any one of these SIs getting bounced just deals damage next turn anyway, so. Well yeah. played. Boom comes to the hand for Zelay, but too well little too late. Fought. Not gonna be the card he needs to win the race here. Boom can oftentimes be so devastating against Rogue if you're able to get it in a collective situation, but Zelay's been on the back foot this game since the Violet Teacher came down on four uncontested. The rogue getting work done for you. He's gonna go into the uh, the druid of Zelay next. Two one up potentially, uh, but to win the whole match with his rogue. Yeah, yeah definitely being be... being rewarded for the rogue pick here. We we talked about it being an unconventional choice, but he picks up an important win to go two one up in the series, and um, he has a decent chance of competing against druid as well. About how do you you feel about the intricacies of this matchup? It's something where um, opinions <laughs> vary wildly, player to player. I think. Yeah, there's been lots of debates on which matchup is favored here. The raw statistics show that actually Druid's favored, but there's just a, a lot of different archetypes of Rogue and a lot of different sort of tech cards that uh, change the matchup a lot. And I think the minion-based Rogue, which uh, it seems Yigut has as he has things like Dr. Boom, he has a Sludge Belcher in there. The more minions, the better I think Rogue does against Druid because they just have the saps, they have the swing cards that can benefit from being able to get all those minions onto the field. 
Right. It's another matchup um, very much like the mid-range hunter matchup, where something like Azure Drake prep plus spell or Violet Teacher prep plus spell can just be hugely swinging in the in the mid-game turns because. Yeah, there's kind of a, a meme that casters talk about, probably a little bit too much with Druid, where like they don't want to be removing minions, they don't play that much efficient removal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if you if you're able to do that thing where you reverse the state of a board entirely and you take away their minions and replace them with your own, that's the kind of tempo swing that Druid just really, really does struggle to come back from. Yeah, exactly. And it's a three card combo, so it's actually kind of hard for the rogue to pull off, especially since he's required to pull it off on turns like four and five. So yeah. getting that three card combo isn't the most consistent thing in the world. But we see here, you do already has the prep, he already has the sap. Now he just needs to find that Violet Teacher or that Ezra Drake. Absolutely nothing to do in the meantime, but dagger up on turn two, not a particularly uncommon sight to see from an oil rogue, so he won't be feeling too bad about that, but he is going to need to pick up a, a couple of options here to make sure he doesn't fall behind a little bit too far. Yeah, not looking too good. It looks like he's just going to cycle the Phantom Knives, try and find more useful cards. His Phantom Knives, not the greatest against Druid. Doesn't really do too much unless it's one of those like, aggro Druids, but Soleil has been playing the mid-range Druid. Yeah, there's a world where it's also relevant to put the one damage on that Shade, since he has the Blade Flurry in his hand, so it essentially buys him an extra turn for things like uh, Spell Power Blade Flurry or Deadly Poison Blade Flurry if he draws into it to still be effective against the stealth. Um, delay off to a really good start this game with the coin wild growth into the shade, but uh, fumbles a little bit on the turn four play. Not much to do here. Do you use living roots as minions against rogue, or do you save it to try and use it as removal? It's interesting. I mean, there might be a temptation to use it, having just seen the the fan of knives. But honestly, when your rogue the rogue has a pre-equipped dagger ready to go, like how much value are you going to get from the tokens anyway? So. Yeah, I kind of like holding on to it, especially when you already have a Drake in your hand. And Rogue plays a reasonable amount of 3-3s three in their deck. There's at least a couple of SIs, sometimes there's a Farseer as well. So, you know, Drake, Drake Living Roots can definitely be an effective uh, tempo swing later on. Yeah, I like that a lot. That line of thinking of the Drake plus the uh, Living Roots, especially since you have the Lothab coming down on 5, which is going to force them to have to play a minion. And yep. then you can play the Drake with the Living Roots to maybe hang off a 3-3. Three, three. Um, so yeah, like you said, it looks like Lurtheb is going to come down here. Um, just lock out any potential value from this uh, Blood Mage Thanos. Normally, as you said, leaving a rogue with spell power is pretty dangerous, but if you're locking them out with a Lurtheb, there's no great harm in letting this Blood Mage live for one extra turn. If anything, it just uh, you know, denies the, the rogue some options, forces them to trade it in inefficiently if their hand doesn't have anything to do. Yeah, it turns out spell power is not the most useful thing when you can't use spells. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have guessed? That's a good draw, though. Yeah, definitely. He's got two different options here now. I think Ezra Drake's a little bit better than the Sludge Belcher, as the Sludge Belcher does kind of get cleaned up by the low that did more. Efficient. Interesting. I kind of like poking the, the Blood Mage in there first before we played. Uh, before we played the Drake, just to maybe get another option, then just, re then just play the Drake and have it contesting. Because um, otherwise, you know, the Blood Mage can get hero powered down and give the value trade with the 5-5 five, uh, five, five into the 4-4. Four, four. And you don't have a dagger up right now, so you need to kind of invest some mana into answering that problem. Yeah, it might be a little bit of a misstep there, because the 5-1 could actually be annoying to deal with, which is sometimes weird. But he is drawing two cards, so maybe he just anticipates he's going to be finding some way to deal with it. But, uh, meanwhile, on Zelay's side, that is a pretty juicy swipe. He gets to continue ramping his mana up, which is... Sometimes you want to save Wild Growth for Cycle, especially in more controlly matchups, but this is a much more heavily tempo-based matchup. So just getting all the mana ahead is extremely powerful, especially with two draw cards in your hand with Ancient Alor and Ezra Trick. Absolutely. So now looking at Yugate's hand, he does have some of those swingy options we looked at with, you know, Prep Sap, but that's a lower theft we're looking yeah. at right now. That's not a dude we want to be sapping when we're playing Rogue. Yeah, that's like the one thing you can't sap is like... <laughs> Oh, man, because you can even sap Ancient Allure or whatever. It's cost seven to replay it. You can let them draw cards. It doesn't really matter too much because you can benefit so much off the tempo, but Lotheb's a tricky one. Yeah, that's right. Like, even healing, like, you can sap healing because if they invest, like, have another slow turn just to heal themselves, again, you're just going to snowball with tempo, but Lotheb is just right. such an amazing card at shutting down tempo that it just immediately negates that one turn of tempo you get from the sap for free. You just lose it straight back again the next turn, so... Gonna go with the prep set here and then uh, the Yolo Van Cleef, maybe? 
interesting. What, how big could he have made the Van Cleef if he used as many cards in his hand? He could have went like prep, prep, sap, backstab Van Cleef. <laughs> Well, he couldn't. He would have couldn't have had a target for the other sap, right? So he couldn't. Oh, have, that's uh, true. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's actually just it, because like back, he could have just used the he other prep use... if he wanted to, but he couldn't yeah. backstab anything. He could have backstabbed the yeah. lower third first. Yeah. He okay. could have made a ten ten for funsies. Obviously, yeah. not a very good play, <laughs> but uh, I mean, if you want to all in, there's one way to do it. But having to sap low third can never feel good. Right, but I like the play of like, he felt kind of pressured enough to have to do it, and the way he chose to do it, he gave himself a 6 6 on the board that just deals with it the next turn anyway if Lower Third was to be replayed. And then he has the minions to develop alongside it if that situation came up. So, um, sure. definitely like made the best of a bad world that turn. Um, but yeah, wasn't quite planning around the innovate, which makes yeah. things a little bit messier. Yeah, yeah, it's not a good world to be in for sure. But uh, at least he has the 6 6. At least he has the 6 6. And now he's got to be start worrying about combo from Zelay because he saw Zelay using the the wild growth earlier on in like kind of like an awkward turn, and combo's got to be in the back of your mind. So hmm. twenty one damage if he leaves up. No, not twenty one. Twenty damage if the Drake leaves up if there's combo. So he's got to kind of be conscious about that. Maybe we'll see a defensive turn here with Sludge Belcher. Also kind of helps protect his six one after the trade. Sure. This is kind of a weird situation to see a rogue player in where they're kind of stuck in a clunky situation where they're only allowed to play one card each turn. Obviously, the lower third effect is having a huge impact on that, but as you said, this is a really minion heavy rogue, and you're not really used to seeing this oil rogue deck with like three kind of slowish minions in their hand um, in this sort of situation. Normally, you see rogue putting together multiple um, copies of cards per turn, which they kind of have to because, like, Strangely, card for card, their, their cards aren't that efficient. They generally do have to, like, one for two themselves a lot, and they rely on sprint to refill, but Yagoot's in a situation where he just kind of has to plod along at the pace of one card per turn at the moment. Yeah, Yagoot takes the trade into the 4-4 spell power. Play around swipe a little bit so swipe doesn't clean up his board so devastatingly if uh, Zelay would to have it. Dr. Boom. Dr. Boom's one of those cards that Rogue can really struggle with healing. And saving that Living Roots is going to turn out to be pretty huge for Zelay. He had the opportunity to play it a little bit earlier on in the game, decided not to, and uh, it turns out he made the right choice there. Yeah, he's seriously going to need to find some sort of answer. If you've randomly put a big game hunter in your Rogue deck, this would be the time to draw it, but no such luck. Picks up an Eviscerate. Um, I mean, it's not a ridiculous tech, it's something I've seen a bit, just purely because, as you say, like, Rogue really, really has nightmares about dealing with Dr. Boom, so I have certainly seen some Rogue players playing with a, a big game hunter in their deck purely for that reason. You can actually deal with it quite efficiently here, using the Prep of Viserade, and then can develop the SI to take yeah. down the Lothab. That's one of the cleanest ways I've seen Dr. Boom go down. Yeah, all made possible by that SI coming off the top that really takes care of the, the auxiliary problem with the with the Lurther. So yeah, that was a, a huge uh, sequence of draws there from, from Yagu. And actually now he's just looking in a pretty favorable position. He yeah. would love to pick up a, a sprint at some point now that he's consolidated this board lead, like just to refill himself on some options. But he has the Shredder to keep going and he has a Sap to leverage for a turn of tempo. Um, so he'll gain a, a little bit of an extra board advantage you'd imagine over the next couple of turns, and if he can pick up a sprint to capitalize on that afterwards, could definitely uh, definitely seal this game. Yeah, and he needs to work on trying to find some sort of healing a little bit too, because he's getting awfully close to that 14 health range. Right. And I've been pl I've played Rogue so many times before where you get so close to winning against Druid, and then they just 14 you out of nowhere. It's very sad. But Zelay here picks up the Emperor Thor sign. He's got one combo piece in hand. Could potentially set up for some disgusting sort of combo turns. But he's got to try and figure out what he wants to do with his Druid of the Claw. He's got charge options for trading, or he's got just the taunt option. But taunting is always scary, especially in the face of spell power and in the face of the potential sap. Yeah, he has already seen one sap come out of your goot, so he might feel a little bit safer against it. But as you say, also there's just the spell power option. So he is going to go for bear form. Um, which Yagoot is probably going to feel pretty good about because now he knows if he does choose to sap that back, it's not an option to be able to be charged back at him again the following turn. Yeah. And under the Lothab effect, Yagoot's not afraid at all of the potential combo from Zelay dealing 20 damage, so he doesn't even have to respect the Ezra Drake and can set up his own lethal potentially, or threat of lethal as it may be. All right, so he'll put him to 21, 18. He'll have 13 showing on the board next turn, plus the Drake. So he would be threatening lethal with something as simple as an Eviscerate. But I get the feeling he's used both already. 
Um, I might be thinking of the other game, though, because he eviscerated a knife juggler. He's definitely used one to clear out the Doctor Boom. I haven't kept count precisely, but I'm sure Zalay has. Um, so a lot of, like, how threatened he's going to feel here is, is whether there's an eviscerate left. Um, and there is still the decision to make the slightly defensive play and trade. Because um, if you don't feel you can um, set up a, a believable threat of lethal and force your opponent to trade, you know, that Drake hitting you in the face next turn, Hero Power hitting you in the face next turn, you are still then at 14, so you will die to turn after. Yeah, definitely. But then, if you can make the believable threat of lethal, then your opponent has to trade, and yep. then you just snuck in an extra 4 damage. So, risk-reward there, Yagoot feels like it's too much of a risk to try and gain that 4 extra damage. Yeah, absolutely. I think, like as I said, a lot of the believability of it comes down to how many eviscerates are left in the deck. I haven't kept track perfectly, but I feel like there's something nagging in the back of my brain. I can't remember when he used the first one, but I feel like he did. Yeah, he definitely used one earlier on in the game. Okay, uh, then then both are gone, because he used one to clear Dr. Boom, right? So, in that yeah, case, yeah, both are definitely one. gone. Oh, okay, right. Sure. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> but uh, the hand size difference here pretty huge. So if Zelay could somehow get this board back, I don't think he's going to lose it unless Yagoot is able to get a sprint. Uh, he's going to go with the YOLO Emperor play, it looks like. I mean, I guess when you can only develop one minion a turn anyway, why not develop Emperor so then next turn you can develop two minions? Makes some sense. Sure. Um, I think we're almost certainly going to see this Fan of Knives cycled. There we go. Violet Teacher. So which of these two minions do we like developing here? Mm. I like the Shredder a little bit more. You don't have any spells in hand to benefit off the Violet Teacher, so the Shredder's just the bigger body. Yeah, I agree. Just gets in for one more every turn, which seems relevant at this point. If you're not going to pick up any heal, you know you're on a clock, because you know, every turn that ticks past, if your Druid is, is able to sneak in a turn where he does push you below 14, especially with the Emperor effect gone now, you feel even more terrified of potential combinations that can kill you. Uh, second Druid of the Claw being picked up that can actually still be activated in charge form is very relevant as well with that Savage Roar in the hand. Yeah, and with the Savage Roar discounted, the other Savage Roar could potentially be used with the Druid of the Claw, creating a little nifty amount of damage there for 12. If he is able to pick it up. But uh, this turn, I feel like he's just going to develop two minions. He sort of set this up last turn by playing the Emperor. He noticed in his hand all of his minions could only be played one at a time. So then he played Emperor, and now he could play... The Ancient Allure for set for six and the Druid of the Claw for four and actually do two things at once. Hmm. Yeah, well, looks like the plan. I mean, are we drawing cards or are we healing in this situation? That's the other question. I would, um, but yeah, I was going to say, I'd be amazed to see the, the heal. It looks a little bit passive, but he does have the second Ancient of Law later that he can use to draw cards if he wants, wants it, but it feels like picking up that Force of Nature is way too important at this point to turn down the card draw. Yeah, it's just too safe to try and go for the heal. You really need to set up your own way to win the game, especially when your opponent has so few cards left. It's actually not very likely that they're going to be killing you with only two cards in their hand. Yep. Attention, class. <laughs> he would have loved a spell power minion to come out of that pilot treader. That would have made this turn so much nicer. Yeah, that's I for sure. To... Have to take the damage here. Uh, and he, then... he could have cleared out the Ancient of Law with the, the attack from the SI agent. So the Druid was never really able to get the board back, but uh, the consequence of Rogue having to use its face to trade with all the minions, he was never really able to find the sprint or find the heal that he really needed to allow his board to live long enough to win the game. That's usually how this matchup goes. Yeah, that's how a lot of matchups go, go right? Like, you, you finally get back to the point against Druid. Like, yes, all right, I've beaten his insane wild growth innovating star. Now I'm back ahead on the, oh, never mind, I'm dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh dear, Druid Combo takes down Yaku, and we're down to our fifth game here. It's a five-game series in our first quarter final. I think this just goes to show how stacked this tournament is. It's going to be the Hunter of Yaku versus the Druid of Zolay. Uh, guys, we've seen four games, but it's basically just a uh, best of one now, right, between the Druid and the Hunter. One of these players yeah. is going to advance. It's single elimination. We'll find out which one it's going to be. The, the Druid of Zolay versus the Hunter of Yaku in game five. Yeah, this is a matchup that's traditionally very heavily favored towards the Hunter, but it really depends on the archetypes of the decks. We see Zelay has some tech in his deck with Living Roots, and I'm not really sure what kind of Hunter Yagood's deck is. I think, yeah, exactly. It's just so hard to ignore a Druid's board. You have to respect them at least a little bit because they're just so powerful with the Savage Roar. Yeah, uh, this does appear to be a mid-range deck. That is a web spinner. That's a value card. It's not a very aggressive card, so be surprised if there's a great deal of uh, web spinner in the, of, of, sorry, of Wolf Rider in this deck. Yeah, exactly. 
So here, as lay, you just get the living roots out there. Just kind of trade off that web spinner and deal with it right now, even though one of your roots die. Or you save it back and try and use it for removal like you did against the rogue. Uh, I think it feels pretty good here, answering a 1-1 one -one with two 1-1s one -ones of your own. Seems pretty reasonable, and it just seems to fit your curve really nicely. Spend your one mana card this turn, wild growth, and then you have the keeper, which is a, a really swingy card to come down against the two drop that your opponent's going to play next turn. What if he uh, goes coin wild growth this turn, and then next turn he can go hero power to kill off the 1-1, one -one, and then use it as the two damage removal spell to kill something like knife juggler or man scientist? Um, that's interesting. I think I still like... The, just the smooth curve play of 1, 2 into 4. Um, just because like that gives you... like You're going to suffer a turn of tempo. Their 2-drop is going to you know get one turn to operate for free. But you have answers to all of the 2-drops, whereas um, your plan would suffer if his 2-drop was, say, Haunted Creeper. Sure, sure. Go for the more consistent play. Makes some sense. And we do see Haunted Creeper drawn, so <laughs> yep. I think he chose to make the 1-1s this way. And now he's going to have Wild Growth to follow up and then try and get the Keeper down on that Haunted Creeper. So, as the Hunter here, what 2-drop is the better 2-drop to play? Because this happens actually a lot for Hunter players. Yeah, they do have a, a stack of 2-drops in their deck. They're usually playing Knife Jugglers for sure, Scientists for sure, Creepers almost certainly. Um, and then some of them have things like King's Alec as well, although they tend to replace the Knife Jugglers. Um, so they always have a lot of 2-drops to pick from, and this decision's pretty crucial. We saw a lot of situations yesterday... Um, with Zoo decks and with Hunter decks, where people picking the wrong 2-drop actually just cost them the entire game. Yeah. And that's something that's really easy to miss um, when you're trying to improve as a Hearthstone player, um, just because the decision that actually lost you the game is so disconnected from the end of the game that it's hard to put those things together, but it's a really important skill to try and pick up. But I like the Creeper here. I think the, the Scientist has a little bit more value going forward. Yeah, the Creeper just contests the board so well with that 1-1, one, one, Yeah, more so than the Scientist does. The Scientist would make it so a little bit more vulnerable to so many AoE effects and the hero power. But here, Animal Companion, no question coming down, and Yakut's got a really solid curve to back this up with the, uh, the Shredder behind it right on 4. And even the 5-drop if he wants to take that option. Sure. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's no potential for the for the high main plays with the Haunted Creeper. The Spectral Spiders aren't beasts, so you can't do the pop your dude and draw two cards plan that you can with the high main. But he has a five drop to play. It is a five mana Bloodfen Raptor, essentially. But, you know, it might get the job done. I mean, hmm. not the worst card in the world. And in Zelay's shoes here, Keeper of the Grove I don't think accomplishes too much here. So I'm expecting to see this piloted Shredder come down as it just lines up so well against the Leoc. Yeah, seems legit. He does have the, the swipe to deal with this board. It's sometime in the future, but because of that annoying one health on the on the creeper that he can't deal with right now, it's not too effective this turn. So Pilot Shredder definitely looks like the most competitive option here. Sure. He's definitely got to be afraid of Houndmaster as well, though. So, like, if Houndmaster were to come down, buffing this Leoc up to a 4-6, maybe that would be able to take down the Pilot Shredder, and then the Spider could trade with the 2-drop. So maybe he's thinking about Coin Lothab to try and play around that eventuality. But he does end up going with the Pilot Shredder. Hmm. Yeah, I think this is okay. I think in the Houndmaster eventuality, if those trades do happen as you described them, I think the Swipe Hero power play next turn with the Coin like deals with that situation reasonably well. So. Um, and I like him just you know, taking the risk, making the board development play. Obviously, Houndmaster would not have been good for him there by any means, but yeah. <laughs> since he has a reasonable answer to it, you know, he can, he can uh, say to his opponent, all right, I'm, I'm going to make you have it at least and just make the best play that I can on the board this turn. Sure, sure. Zelay has the option to clear the entire board here with Swipe potentially if he wants to, using like Coin and then Hero Powering down the Haunted Creeper, then Swiping and Trading, something like that. Yeah, I like it, because it would also leave a 2-1 minion isolated on, on the board against what you would expect to be a Freezing Trap. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like a pretty powerful situation to leave yourself in. Yeah, and then you got Lothab and the follow-up turn to that. Hundreds usually don't have the strongest turn 5 plays. As we can see, Yakuts is a Starving Buzzard. So turn 5 is usually <laughs> kind of one of their weak spots, unless they have, like, either Belchers in their deck, or maybe Ram Wrangler, which requires a board, or Lothan. So they don't have too many options. So yeah, I definitely favor the board clear play here. And this is good ordering as well. He had two different ways he could have done this that were essentially the same, but this one plays around uh, Snake Trap being the secret. He'd have popped the Scientist first and used the Hero Power on a target afterwards, and then he could have got messed up by Snakes, so I like this. 
Right, he's got the five drop. But I think he's going to have to play <laughs> off-curve here. Meta efficiency isn't always the right play. I mean, we, we could take it all the way back to like 2013 here. We might end up with a Buzzard Unleash combo. That could be sick. That could be just game-changing. And he draws into the Hunter's Marks that he needs to get through the Druid of the Claw or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the days, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but here... Zlay... Definitely going to try and search for that freezing trap. He's going to find it. So he's able to take care of that. That Alex Draza's champion could come into play with charge later on if he picks up an Ezra Drake. Oh, wow, well, that's true, actually, yeah. Uh, Master a little bit late to the party. He does have the potential to trade in the Shredder, try and find a two drop down Master Buff, but just doesn't seem too efficient. Doesn't. I mean. I think you still play it. I was going to say, how do we feel about just playing it as a 4-3 this turn? Yeah, and then just smack and face. I mean, you got a bunch of damage in your hand with Unleash the Hounds and Kill Command. Yep. And this Shredder's resolving to the face, so... you got a bit of a sticky board to deal with. I mean, it's no high main by any means, but... Like, you got a decent-sized board accumulated. And maybe you just have enough damage to squeak it out. Hey, that's a good card to draw on turn 7. Yeah, I've, I think I would play that one. I've, I've, <laughs> I've heard rumors that drawing turn 7... Dr. Boom is usually pretty good. Yeah, Dr. Boom can come down here and he can trade off one of the four threes. The Shredder is still going to be able to connect to the face and the Boom Bats are going to open up Unleash the Hounds for doing a little bit more extra damage. Unfortunately for Yakut, it's not quite the turn eight where he can get the full combo off yet, but... Right. Yeah, if Zelay chooses to go for the Ancient of Law here for some reason and then plays Dr. Boom on eight, that could actually be potentially disastrous for him just... Because as you said, he can then like cycle into the hunter's mark with the with the hound's draws. But now, unfortunately, only seven mana to play his eight mana combo, so he might just have to abandon his hopes and dreams. Now, when you see your opponent swing face with that Lothed while well, that trades on board there, you gotta be feeling there's probably a savage drawer in reserve. There's gotta be some damage from the side of the druid, and that's just totally a bluff here from Zelay, right? There's nothing in his hand besides maybe force of nature to try and push through damage. Yeah. So it's going to be up to Yagoot to see how much he believes Zelay and how honest Zelay is being with how much damage he has. Is if he's going to be trading here or if he's just going to initiate the face race back himself. Right, and actually Yagoot is the one that's actually much, much closer to threatening lethal, right? He has 8 on board, 5 from the kill command, that's 13. 4 from the dogs, that's 17. So if he had the 1 extra mana to hero power, he actually wouldn't be doing the buzzard unleash combo. He would just be killing him. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it might be important here for Yagoot not to fall for the bluff here. He can just really engage the face race if he wants to. Yeah, he's got the ability to like use bow potentially yep. for over the next two turns to deal six damage. He can weave in hero powers if he wants, or he can use unleash the hounds, play it a little safe, and clear off these boom bots and lower the impact of Savage Roar. Oh, he's gonna he fall for the bluff. Trade. He's taking big trades here. Wow. So maybe this will buy Zelay enough time to get towards that turn nine where he can use the combo since Zelay is trading. Oh. He's only half buying the bluff. He kills the Lothab, but... Uh, yeah, I think this is actually a, a reasonable halfway play, because he's still threatening lethal pretty hard next turn. Um, something like a swipe is, is more dangerous in this situation because of the way he did it, but he's still threatening lethal pretty hard. Um, just with the, the damage he has from hand, he has lethal. Um, he's going to need a cheaper beast or one of the beasts to hmm. stick in order to both kill command and hero power, but... Hmm. Yeah, so Zelay's... Kind of on the back foot here now that Yagut hasn't completely bought his aggression bluff, and now he doesn't have the tempo and he's forced to be the one trading. Otherwise, he's got to expect certain death. Favorable boom bad for him, taking out a high value health target. See how well the other one lines up for him. He really wants to be able to connect this boom to the face at all yeah. times. Yeah, he's just itching for this 7 damage to go face. But... I'm just going to have to do something fancy. The Azure Drake draw would have been pretty nice this turn, just to allow him to use the Alex Draws as champion <laughs> to kill the Houndmaster. That would sure. get the seven to connect to face, but unless he wants to use Force of Nature, it's going to have to be a trade, I'm afraid. There we go. Yeah, he's backing down from the race and accepting his fate, trying to heal out. He's noticing that uh, Zelay has just so many more cards than Yugu has, so he definitely has more value in the trade and board control game. It's just going to be a question of if he has enough life to make it to that point. For sure, yeah. Um, so Savage Raw uh, pick up here would of course be lethal. A ton of damage on the board already. 
And that is not a savage draw. That is just about the worst card you can draw on turn nine. But with this, is this hand it can potentially do some things? Does it open up any more options for him? Not really. He can play 11 mana's worth of stuff with three minions if he wants to, but eh. I mean, might as well do it, right? Right. The innovate's yeah, not getting any better. Yeah, just try and translate your card advantage into tempo advantage. That's kind of the stage of the game we're at, so... Possibly do it. He's just gonna use it maybe to weave in the hero power and play all the other minions. But he's gotta be kind of worried about the second Unleash the Hounds with a kill command. Because that's the big damage combo, right? Yeah. So, uh, Unleash the Hounds right now would be... Three and then kill command would be five more, and then hero power would make it ten. So you can't really play around it. So he could just full develop all the minions and try and set up for lethal next turn. I think that would make some sense. He's already dead to that two card combo at this point already, so there's no point in only playing one more minion here. I don't think you might as well play both, but he seems to disagree. Um, but the unleash is not in hand. The kill command is, and uh, I think. Even with the defensive kill command here, I think like from Yagut's perspective, the defensive kill command keeps him alive, but. Uh, we know that it doesn't. Well, yeah, the force of nature well, is going to be able to take him down. And even if it kept him alive, he can't even develop the Dr. Boom behind yeah. it, so he's literally doing nothing with his turn besides maybe playing our old friend Buzzard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, uh, good comeback there from Zelay to take the series 3-2 to two with his Druid against the Hunter. Uh, unfortunate for Yagu, making it all the way through the group stages and following, falling at the first hurdle of the playoffs. Uh, Fireman, a pretty impressive performance from Zelay. We did say that he probably was on the, the fuzzy end of the lineups there. Yeah, I don't think he had a very... Uh, I think the matchups, like, lineup-wise, he was probably not favored, like, 40-60, something like that. But uh, Druid can do Druid things, and he was able to string together some good plays with Druid and uh, made it happen. So, how did you see that matchup? Yeah, pretty pretty similar analysis actually. I think with the 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 way the matchups came out, although his lineups were unfavored, the matchups came out in a in a fairly reasonable way for him. They could have um, lined up in a in a worse situation just on the pick order, but he definitely was disadvantaged going in just because of Yagoot winning the battle of the the mind games. If our analysis on that process was correct, um, so yeah, just really well played to to crush it out. Understood the a lot of mid range battles going on in that series, and he understood like the real mid range power spike turns and picked the right time to make the pushes and take them home. All right, we want to thank our sponsors, G2A, Esport Gaming, Match Arena, our French streaming partners, O Gaming, and our production partners, QXO Esports Studio, while we're doing that. And uh, we're going to go to a short break before we come back with our second quarterfinal. It's a match between two players who have been itching to play each other in this tournament. I'll tell you all about it when we come back. It's going to be RDU versus Sixo.